Welcome in to the Husker 24-7 podcast. I, of course, am Mike Schaefer, joined by Michael Brunt here on this beautiful July 14th day. Brunt, how's it going? Not bad. It's the uh, the doldrums of summer, as you said, before we got going. Yeah. Did you like my use of doldrums? That's good. It, it I think it kind of gets to where we're at right now. We have like one week of doldrums now with the way yeah. the off season is. So um, enjoy it, I guess. What do you plan to do if you're doldrums time? I'm going to get the heck out of town. So <laughs> where are you going? I didn't know this. Uh, I'm going to go sit on a beach in, uh, oh. on the East coast. Very nice. That yeah. sounds exciting. Yeah. You know, you can sit on Capitol beach. It's all the same thing. I, I I've sat at the uh, Pawnee Lake a couple times this summer. It, it's uh you get those wave runners going by, and, oh, and man, the, yeah. the, the waves really get crashing there. Mm, you got to be careful. Yeah, got to be careful. All right, so college football, which never stops, continued again for Nebraska this past week in both the uh, transfer portal aspect and the recruiting aspect. We'll start with the recruiting side of things. Defensive end, outside linebacker, edge rusher, Ashley Williams became the latest to commit to Nebraska. That puts him now at 14 commitments. Uh, they were at seven at this time last year. Um, where do you want to start with Ashley Williams? Obviously, there's a lot of different ways to, to go with this one. Uh, but what where, where do you want to start with as we kind of move around what this commitment means and, you know, what it kind of means for Nebraska's efforts in Louisiana, too? Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, I, I I like what Nebraska is doing with its edge edge rusher class here. I mean, you you add Ashley Williams with Maverick Noonan. I mean, those are two pretty good kind of pieces of clay to start with. I think for for Nebraska's strength program. I mean, you you look at Ashley Williams; he's extremely productive. You know, was was part of a state championship winning team in Louisiana, and just. You, you watch his highlights, he's really instinctive. And I, I think, you know, we've had this conversation, I feel like, on podcasts for years about, you know, how Nebraska needs to the, basically the way to go about recruiting the edge Develop. position. Develop them, yeah. But it, it feels like this class in particular, they're starting with a little bit of a higher floor than maybe what they've had in previous classes. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I definitely like Maverick Noon. I, so part of it is that instead of kind of wishing that a guy is going to put on the weight or wishing that a guy is going to ultimately have the production or taking a chance on a basketball player turned defensive end outside linebacker in high school, I mean, you, you got two guys in Maverick Newton and Ashley Williams that sort of know the game at a little bit higher of a level and have been playing it for a long time. And so I, I think you, you phrased it pretty well. Like they're the upside – is high, but even where they start at, like the sort of base level that they come in at feels higher than sort of where Nebraska has been at with some edge rushers in the past. Yeah. I, and it was interesting, you know, right before Ashley Williams committed and, you know, it was, it, you know, kind of clear that Nebraska was trending there for him. I, a number of people reached out to me randomly from Louisiana, from Texas, um, that, that cover football down there and basically said like, Love this kid as a prospect, love his highlights, love his potential. Um, and a little bit of surprise, I think, that he wasn't getting more recruiting attention. Like, I, I, I think in some ways he's, a, he's been a little bit under-recruited with the skill set that he has. And, you know, I, I, you can go into this, I think, because you kind of hinted at it earlier. But another example of, you know, Mickey Joseph knowing where to go in the state and kind of the, the full team effort of recruiting a prospect with Brian Applewhite being involved with Eric Chenander stopping through the school this spring. I mean, you know, Mike Dawson on the official visit. And it, it's just another example of that kind of all hands on deck recruiting approach. I think Nebraska is doing uh, with, with good results um, in, in this class. Yeah. Before I dive into kind of Louisiana and what Nebraska has been doing there, uh, does that description that you gave, does that fit anybody else that you can think of Nebraska's picked up in the last few years? There's one player that immediately came to mind to me when you were talking. And it, it kind of reminded me, and this is different because, you know, he chose Nebraska over Auburn and Georgia. 
though there were at the time was some questions as to like how much those schools wanted him. But it sounds a little like Quentin Newsom, the way that, you know, guys in our network were talking about Quentin Newsom that had seen him play. They were pretty enamored with him um, as a high school prospect. And he committed in July to Nebraska over those other programs. It was it was basically Minnesota. And I don't know how involved Texas was. Uh, I know that he took that unofficial visit, but um, is there is there anybody else that you can think of that kind of fits that description where people in the network are a little surprised that there wasn't a little more recruiting juice for said individual? No, they put me on the spot now. Um, did you did you have somebody besides Newsom in mind? Because that was kind of where my mind went. I know there was at, at the time. And it, I guess this is a Georgia theme, but Miles Farmer was that way a little bit yep, yep. in high school too, where, you know, I, I know that the player personnel folks and um, analysts liked him a lot more than maybe, you know, what, what his ranking was at the time and, and what he was being recruited as. Yeah, I don't, I, there's been some guys in Florida, but they haven't gone necessarily Nebraska's way where there was some surprise that not only was Nebraska able to get them, but they didn't really have to fight off that many people for them. Um, but again, like those haven't quite worked out. Uh, I, I, I don't, I mean, Quentin Newsom was like the sharpest one that came to my mind. And uh, like I said, some of that is that it was still a little unclear, like when he was choosing Nebraska over Georgia and Auburn, how realistic those opportunities were, but you look at him play now. And I mean, I don't know. I, I would certainly listen to a case if someone argued that he could be Nebraska's best player in 2022. I don't know that it's the most likely thing, but I mean, that, that was, like I said, the, the first person that came to mind and now I'm sitting here thinking about it and I don't know that there's, there's necessarily <laughs> another, but yeah. Well, and I, I mean, 24 uh, seven has Ashley Williams, I think rated as an 89 and yeah. that, that kind of range, you know, the the very very high three and the very low four, there's not much difference there in, in no. terms of rank and and you know kind of how guys pan out. I think, but I mean, I, I think he's a guy that with the strong another strong senior year would be a potential kind of arrow up guy in terms of ranking. And I mean, he had monster stats last season. You you know, he was really disruptive. Um, in terms of tackles for loss and sacks. So, um, you know, and, and with the schedule they play there too, he, he's going to have a lot of eyes on him. That is one of the things I've kind of noticed. If you look at the linebackers that Nebraska's brought in, whether it's Maverick Noonan, Hayden Moore, Dylan Rogers, or now Ashley Williams, they're all just like disruptive is kind of the perfect word for it, which is, it, it seems like a well duh statement when you're talking about high school kids. Like if they're this good, they should be disruptive. But you don't always know what someone's tackle for loss is. But when you look at Hayden Moore and, and Ashley Williams, I mean, they were putting huge, huge numbers up. And that, that kind of dominance to me is good because you want to see that these guys have reached a high level at some point. That it's not always just, you know, wait till we get them here and we're going to unlock something. Sometimes when they have that they, they can build off of that they've already played at a high level, even if it's a high school level, that can sort of help their development in some way. Well, and I think too, you know, if a guy is not productive at the high school level, I think it's really hard and across a number of positions. And I think running back is a good example of this to a degree wide receiver as well, that it's hard to just all of a sudden kind of kickstart the like, yeah. okay, now, now we're going to get some production out of him. Like it, it's that way it's you know if you look at like completion percentage for quarterbacks it's not yep. like that suddenly you know gets significantly better when a guy gets to college um and I, i'm glad you mentioned and hate more you know similar numbers to ashley you know, like 144 tackles or something insane yeah and you know really athletic kid and, and kind of the same profile in some ways where he plays at a, plays a high level of football in denver um, and yeah, I mean, you kind of look at what they're doing with edge position and the guys they've got at that inside spot. And I mean, we kind of hit on this last week, I think, but it, it, that, that the, both of those linebacker groups, I guess edge is now in with the defensive line, but, um, they're, they're both 
adding good depth, I think, and pieces that you can really build around. For sure. So we we mentioned Louisiana and and what Nebraska's kind of done in there already. So you've got commitments from O'Marion Miller and now Ashley Williams. You have targets in Zalance Hurd and Ryan Robinson, both of which I think could end up in Nebraska's class. Uh, I don't know that I'm ready to crystal ball either one of those. Uh, and then you go back to, to adding A.J. Allen and Dakota's Crawford in the 2022 class. It just really feels like Nebraska's done a nice job in that state in large part because of Mickey Joseph, but then these guys also get up here. And I don't know if it's just a way that Mickey has sort of framed what they're going to see in Lincoln, but I, I just feel like that you look at O'Marian Miller's comments and Ashley Williams comments that first visit weekend and, and Brian Christopherson caught up with each one of them. I mean, I, I just feel like they, everyone's usually surprised they get here. It's not just cornfields, but I just think that they, connect really well both with the staff but also just the area and i think some of that is that they've done a nice job with the coldest crawford and aj allen you have mickey joseph you have trey palmer you have some of these guys that can sort of build a little subculture of louisiana that's available for some of these visitors i wrote about it in the morning mash earlier this week but it's it's hard to just go build a pipeline because a lot of times guys want to be at least know a few people that know their area that understand where they're from. And that sounds weird. If you're a lifelong Nebraskan that grew up rooting for Nebraska, it, it, you know, you're already in it. Like this isn't a conversation necessarily about you, but when you're talking about people who come from other backgrounds and just distinct regional cultural differences, having guys from Louisiana, I think would be pretty valuable. I mean, I, I know that, um, with the Polynesian community, especially the amount of parents I've talked to and, and even some recruits that are basically like, yeah, we like what Nebraska offers in terms of the physical aspect. And we like the coaching staff, but it's just unclear how comfortable the fit is either from the Polynesian perspective or also sometimes the Mormon Latter-day Saint perspective. That, you know, Nebraska and, and Tony Tuioti really wanted to recruit some LDS or Polynesian kids. And there wasn't necessarily that established culture beyond his own family and a handful of other guys that were passing through. Like, and that really matters. Like, I, I just think that maybe gets undersold sometimes. No, it definitely does. And it's it's kind of interesting, though, because I correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the guys that they've gotten out of Louisiana the last couple classes they're not like New Orleans guys. No, like they're they're from you know northern Louisiana. I mean, Marion Miller's from you know way 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 north northwest corner, yeah, northwest uh, corner. Shreveport has been kind of the the more focal point for several of these guys because Neville is only probably about an hour away from Shreveport. Dakota's Crawford and Marion Miller, uh, you know, both are in the kind of that Shreveport area, you know. Cotto, where Miller's at, is probably about at 45 minutes northwest of it. But yeah, I mean, it's not it's not just been New Orleans where, you know, when Nebraska's recruited Louisiana in the past, that's pretty much just been what it's been. They've been going to Edna Carr, or John Curtis, or, you know, some of those schools. And the focus has really kind of been on uh, New Orleans. So uh, I don't know where Zachary, Louisiana is. Should we look this up right now on the show? Live research? I think it's uh, outside of Baton Rouge, if I'm not mistaken. All right. So, yeah, I mean, again, another another situation where you're talking about um, not quite sort of everyone thinks Louisiana, they usually think of kids that are coming out of those New Orleans programs. And that's where Stephen Carter, uh, Stanley Morgan, there's three guys that came up, uh, or at least two of them, I think, made it. I don't know. Javion Walt never made it, but they were all Edna oh, Carr kids, I think. They made it. He made it. Yes. Well, I know Tolbert and Irons did. I, something happened with Walton, right? Yeah. He he was here for a bit and then uh, transferred. Yeah. So, but he'll live on forever because of the Howling Wolf shirt that you took a picture of while he was wearing a bucket hat at the 2014 spring game, maybe. 
It's in, the, right? uh, it's in the recruit shirt Hall of Fame along with all of Gerald Foster's cartoon <laughs> I was shirts say, anywhere. <laughs> no one got more out of their official visit attire than Gerald Foster, who had a different uh, screen printed shirt that I was always excited to see every week in 2013. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just think that they've done they've done a nice job building around that, and and I don't think they're done yet in this class, and they're going to start working towards 2024. Uh, I wish BC was on because I think he would be able to, to verify this for me. But I'm pretty sure Nebraska is like the first offer for Jawan Johnson, who's now just completely blown up out of Louisiana. That's uh, correct. So we'll we'll see if Nebraska can hang in there. But I, I just think, you know, Mickey Joseph's recruiting acumen in that state, his knowledge of the people there, combined with Brian Applewhite, who's done a really nice job in terms of helping out in Louisiana as well. Like it's, it's really opened things up in an area where Nebraska – I think their last kids would have been the ones that we're talking about, like Stanley Morgan. I think Stanley Morgan would have been the last recruit from high school out of Louisiana. I, I can't think of anybody else in between. Oh, no, I can. I can think of one guy. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? Uh, Offensive lineman recruited specifically by Ryan Held. He stood oh, yeah. in the doorway to send his uh, height. Matthew Anderson. Matthew Anderson. I don't know where he's at now. He was a great kid, great story, just wasn't going to work at Nebraska. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's been pretty few and far between until this recent run. And I think it's somewhat sustainable because as long as Mickey Joseph is is at Nebraska, he's going to be putting his energy and effort into that area. And I just – I feel like he's able to connect in a way that gets those guys to come out and – if you've got some Louisiana kids on the team and they start to play well, it's only going to reinforce and build it back. It's it's kind of similar in the, to the way that, you know, Nebraska was with Georgia early on yeah. in, in Scott Frost's tenure. I mean, you don't have to go in there and get seven guys. But, I mean, if, if there's enough talent in that state that if you go in and you get three or four per class, I mean, maybe even two of two guys who are really good fits um, that that you can make a living doing that. And there's obviously, you know, some buzz down there. I think Trey Palmer's probably helped a little bit in that regard as well with some of the 2023 guys and and maybe beyond just because he's a known entity down there. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I view it is, you know, if you can get, let's say three guys per class out of Georgia, you get three, three or four out of Louisiana and you know you you kind of focus on the 500 mile radius I think that's a pretty good recipe for Nebraska recruiting wise going forward no yeah, well, you didn't even mention Florida <laughs> is that uh I mean yeah you get a couple guys out of there but that 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 feels Florida feels a lot farther away than those other two states yeah it, it, it maybe shouldn't but it does yeah, well, and and they have some connections in there. You have DiCaprio Boodle's brother and Dwight Boodle, who's committed in this class. And then uh, potentially they could end up with someone like Cam uh, Lenhart, who isn't technically a Floridian because he's from New Jersey. But uh, I, I don't think it's ever a state where they're, they're going to close it off. But I don't think... I don't think it went quite how they envisioned with the whole 2020 situation. And so they have put a little bit more emphasis in other states in the South. I thought Alabama for a time and two was going to be a state where Nebraska is going to pull, um, you know, a couple kids a year all the time in part because of Cam Taylor Britt, because he's the exact recipe of what Nebraska needs with kids from Louisiana. You need guys that come up, they play well, they're personable and people know who they are back in their state. It just didn't take for whatever reason. And I mean, it wasn't from a lack of effort. Eric Chenander has spent a lot of time, um, bouncing around that state they just weren't able to uh turn those into commitments they got you know a fair amount of official visits and and some excited guys about the program but it just didn't quite work out the way that i thought it was going to so maybe louisiana will be the uh the alternate of that all right uh other news from the week nebraska had a player enter the transfer portal in marquee step I don't think it's a big surprise, though the timing of it is odd. It seems like something that he could have done um, going into the spring.
but I wonder if it's an issue where like he's is he preserving eligibility and then he's going to graduate or something? I guess I just thought the timing of it was unique. I think I think the expectation is, is he's a potential August graduate. Okay, there you go. So then, but would he be? He would need to get a waiver to be able to play somewhere. Uh, well, I think as a grad transfer, you can you're good, right? Okay, but he he has transfer. He would because if I think apart from that, I think he would need one since he's already transferred. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I. I was expecting that at some point this summer. I mean, Nebraska still has to get down to that 85 number. Yeah, I, I was expecting it too, yeah. but it, it made more sense to me like a day after the spring game when it was yeah. pretty obvious that, you know, Anthony Grant just took your carries. Ramir Johnson took your carries last year. Here comes A.J. Allen. There's Gabe Irvin on the mend. And some guy named Jock Yant's still running around the place. So I, I was a little surprised that it took as long as it did to happen. Not surprised that it did happen. What What do you make of that running back room right now? Because as <laughs> I was as I'm as I was writing that that transfer story, like when you just go through and list all of the backs that are there, and backs that are probably pretty well thought of within the program in terms of production, and you're also adding AJ Allen to the mix, Emmett Johnson, uh, another scholarship running back in the mix. I continue to forget about Gabe Irvin um, <laughs> being in that mix as well. Like, I, I struggle to see how you kind of make the math work for how all these guys are going to get carries and how you're going to, you know, kind of make things work. And, you know, Nebraska doesn't have a running back commit in this class as it stands right now. I think you would be okay with not taking one. However, I don't know that everything is going to be status quo going forward with this group because it's a huge group. You know what I'm saying? No, I I definitely know what you're saying. I mean, I see no way in which there isn't a transfer. So we'll start there. And since you assume there's going to be a transfer, that means you pretty much have to go get another high school running back or a junior college guy, or you have to go into the portal yourself. I think a lot of what's going to happen between now and mid-October is Brian Applewhite has to figure out who he has, who he likes, who's got long-term potential, who's a short-term play, who's never going to play, and just go from there. I mean, there's no other – there's really no other route for it. I mean, I, I can't sit here today and tell you that I know who Nebraska's leading rusher is going to be. Um, I would be dubious of anyone who claims that they know. So it's a and, – and frankly, under this staff, that's been a bit of a bugaboo. Like, they – whoever they've started the year with hasn't finished a year with them with the exception of 2020 where, you know, Diedrich Mills is out for the middle portion of the season because of an injury, but it's just been a, uh, a revolving door of trying to figure out what's going on at the running back position. And Brian Applewhite is now the latest one who's, whose ultimate job is to figure out who am I going to elevate and can they perform at a high enough level? Um, I, I, the room is interesting and in that I feel like different guys have different skill sets. So you could blend people together pretty well, but how low would I have to go to tell you that Nebraska's leading rusher for running backs would be X where you're like, all right, I'm going to take the over on that. Like if I said it at six fifty right now, are you for sure taking the over? Um, Cause I'm not. Yeah. Well, in, Here's the thing with that math, too. And Mark Whipple's offenses have tended to be a little bit more throw heavy. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see, on the other hand, though, I think you're going to see less um, quarterback design run. So those those carries have to go to somebody, which would presumably be a running back. I, I would say I would tend to go slightly over. 650. I think my my point would probably be like if you got to like 775, I would start kind of okay. like like I we can price is right this a little bit. I I 800 is way too high. 775 sure. is maybe where I'm a little bit more comfortable. That's where you're thinking about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But here, right. here's the thing though, and and I I think this is a, a valid 
thought. I, I as kind of the Scott Frost era went on, the the way that the running back kind of rotations were have been handled just le- left me scratching my head quite a bit. And I'm I'm very Not eager. Long. I'm very eager to see how Brian Applewhite kind of moves the pieces and what guys are in for what roles. Cause I, I agree with you. I mean, it, there there's guys that seem to have, seem to have the type of bodies and skill sets that would lend themselves to very specific roles within the offense. Ramir, Ramir Johnson being, I think the best example of that. Surely, yeah. you know, Jock Yant too. I mean, he's probably going to be a short, short yardage guy, but um, how you kind of manage that, I think is going to be, fascinating to watch and I, I think they've got to get that right because it, it at times the last few years you're kind of like what's going on here you know like why is this guy in that situation uh why are you th- you know running this play with that guy in the game um so that that's something that i i think we, we probably need to at least be cognizant of going into the season could i tell you that some of those design quarterback runs don't necessarily turn into handoffs but swing passes or more running back design pass plays, because I, I, I think, that. I think one of the things that enamors me about what Ramir Johnson could be this season is that I think I could carve out a way in which he's a thousand yard offensive producer with a blend between receiving yards and rushing yards. Like I, I think that that's a possibility if he's used in the way that I think he could be now. Who knows, you could get to the second game and Ramir Johnson just isn't that guy that he was last year. But I look at their offense, you know, this is a different offense, of course, but I look at the success they had moving the ball against a pretty good Michigan defense, and a lot of it was getting him in space, getting him the ball on a screen, getting him the ball on a wheel route, getting him the ball out of the backfield. I mean, he had his best game, I think, of his career against one of the best defenses, a team that played in the college football playoff, and it was – it was the non-traditional use of him that was really valuable. It helped set up other stuff in that offense. I mean, I, I think when you have a guy like Mark Whipple, who's probably more prone to passing than he is rushing, you can simulate a run game sometimes by getting a guy like Ramir Johnson the ball as he's in motion on those swing passes. And I could see a heavier dose of that kind of thing or designed running back type passes. Um, uh, that sort of chip away at some of the quarterback carries, if that makes any sense at all. No, it does. And I think, I think you're probably actually see a little bit more tight end involvement too. Along oh, yeah. that lines of like, mm-hmm. we're just going to go get, you know, five yard dump pass or something to the tight end versus, you know, where you might've had like Adrian Martinez running right, right into the back of the offensive line. Um, if you were, if uh, I'm just going to keep playing this game where I ask you random questions that put you on the spot. Okay. If you were to make the list of the player that you think will have the most receptions in the 2022 season, how many receivers are you putting in front of Travis Vokalek? Three. Three. And those would be Trey Palmer. I, I, you, you didn't ask that. You said right, how well, many. <laughs> now I'm now I'm trying to I'm trying to reverse engineer your answer to so Trey Palmer. Palmer will be one. Isaiah think, Garcia Castaneda. Garcia Castaneda. And I would, I am uh, cautiously optimistic that Oliver Martin will be one of them. Okay. And to your point, though, I think about Ramir Johnson, I would need to go back and look, but I believe he's like the second leading uh, returning pass catcher. That makes sense. Because... By receptions. Um, yeah. Omar should, Manning's clearing away number one. That shouldn't surprise me, but it kind of surprised me. Like when you say it out loud. <laughs> um, yeah. But I don't know. And to your point too, I, I was as you were talking, I was thinking about something Mark Whipple said. I think it was like the first time that we talked to him um, about the way that they use running backs at Pitt. Like he was very comfortable with really carving out roles for guys like he they had a dedicated third down back I think I want to say they used three or four um that was kind of the number that they landed on and he kind of said like if a guy shows that he's you know able to contribute they'll find a way to kind of work him in um 
And I, I think of, out of any room on that offense, the running back room probably has the most guys that you would look at and say like, oh, yeah, this guy could probably help us in some form or fashion. Yeah, it looks like Ramirez had over like 680 yards last year combined between receptions and rushes. And uh, I I just don't think a thousand is out of the realm of possibility. Like, I, I just think there's a way that you can utilize him um, to, to try to take advantage of those things. I mean, he had, again, and this is why I bring up that Michigan game. He had six receptions for 105 yards and a touchdown and 17 carries for 67 yards, which is obviously a 3.9 yard per carry average and not particularly great, but they were finding ways to get him involved. And that spread out that defense a little bit, which then allowed you to attack other things. I just, I I really think the recipe for Nebraska isn't going to be traditional running back use in this year. I, I just, I don't see one guy getting 200 carries and running for 1200 yards. Like I just, I don't see that happening for Nebraska in 2022. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you there. 775, that's my ceiling. 775, all right. And the guy that you think has the best chance of breaking that would be Ramir Johnson or Anthony Grant? I think Anthony Grant. Oh. Brunts, high on Anthony Grant and Oliver Martin. Yeah, I I, I just think uh, I think Mickey is, is what uh, Oliver Martin needed. I think it's stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, that's the biggest thing for him. No, I'm just throwing random ones at you. Who has more yards, A.J. Allen or Emmett Johnson? A.J. Allen. Who has more total offensive yards, A.J. Allen or Dakotas Crawford? A.J. Allen. Uh, Who has more offensive yards, Elante Brown or Gabe Irvin? Gabe Irvin. These are kind of like tricky, I feel like. They are. Well, I mean, it's... Because we have no idea what the hell's going to happen and what they're going to run, who's going to get used, who's going to play. <laughs> That's what happens when you basically completely reset the deck. Yeah, I know. Like, you're just pulling cards out at this point. Yeah, I'm pulling questions out at this point. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm out. Do you have any you want to throw out there? Anything fire in your brain? At the end of the season, what's Nebraska's turnover differential? Negative five. What uh, what is what will Nebraska's best field goal kicker be for the season, and who will it be? Um, thirteen of seventeen, Timmy Bleakrod with a long of fifty-one. That's that's actually uh, his career long. All right, look at that. If if you uh, if you <laughs> did, you may not have known that, but that's <laughs> Timmy Bleakrod's. Career long is you know who didn't know that this guy. How many uh, how many different quarterbacks start a game for Nebraska this year? Two. Who are they? Uh, that would be Casey Thompson and Chubba Purdy. How many games does Logan Smothers appear in? Is he holding the football on field goal attempts? Uh, as a quarterback. Um. Zero. One, I don't know. I, I, I love Logan. I mean, I love his attitude. I love the way he came out in the spring and and basically said, "I don't want to go anywhere else. This is where I want to be. I can make it work in this offense. I fit in this offense." Until I see it, I just can't believe it. And I just, I look at Casey Thompson and Chubba Purdy as two guys that Mark Whipple helped orchestrate to bring to Lincoln. And if they're healthy and they can play, and I'm not at the point where I'm assuming the third string quarterback is going to play, I'm just going to go with those guys over Logan. Um, And right or wrong, that's just where I'm at right here on July 14th, the doldrums of July. What what percentage of tight end catches does Travis Travis Vokalik have? 97. How many does he finish with? Catches? Yeah. Um, 41. How high is he picked in the draft next year? Higher than Austin Allen, which is that he gets drafted. <laughs> I I could see I could see with the strong year he would he would maybe be in the conversation for a second day, late second day, if early you, early third day. 
like if you simulated this season like a thousand times, there's at least some portion of it in which Travis Vokalek leads the team in like receptions, yards, touchdowns. Like I, I don't think it's what's going to happen, but I think there's at least a possibility that Travis Vokalek could be a really strong contributor for Nebraska this year, in part because of what you're talking about. Like, you know, Casey Thompson got his tight ends involved a little bit in Texas. I think tight ends are going to get more opportunity with Adrian Martinez <laughs> elsewhere. Um, so I, I just, I wouldn't be shocked if Travis Vokalek, you know, I, I'm not looking for him to have a thousand yard season or anything, but could he average in the neighborhood of like six catches a game? I mean, maybe like that puts you at 72 in a 12 game season. That's probably a little high, but four to six catches a game, like that range I think is really doable. You, we've officially reached that point in the off season where we're talking ourselves into Nebraska tight end production. <laughs> uh, tradition <laughs> unlike any other. Yeah. Speaking of that, Ernie Els, do you, does he finish in the top 20? Oh, no. He's already down to two under. Um, scores are going to be pretty low, I think, throughout the day today here and then maybe potentially throughout the tournament. I think the big thing is let's just see if Ernie can make the cut. That's a, that's a good time out for him if he's able to do it. He's, he's one of the professional athletes that I've been around. Like, I've covered PGA events. And he's, like, shockingly large. Like, yeah. I know that he's, like, a former rugby player and all that. But, like, he, he's not a pro golfer. He's, like, a probably, like, a stand-up defensive end in the NFL, like, that size. Yeah. Jay Foreman was talking about how Ernie Els is one of the professional athletes that he's, like, met in person that wasn't like a football or basketball player that made him feel relatively small. Yeah. Cause he's just like everything about the guy is broad. Like his shoulders are broad. He's just like, he's barrel chested. He's a bigger guy. And he sort of just kind of towers over you uh, with his, it's just his overall size. So yeah, I, I hope it goes well for him. He's going to need his back to hold up for four straight days. <laughs> it's uh, that's always been the bugaboo for him here. Yeah. So yeah. we'll, we'll see if he can at least make the cut. Um, what's the winning score at the, the open this year? I haven't seen the weather report for the forecast. It's supposed to be pretty nice all four days. Yeah. You're going to get to like, it, it, I mean, it's not going to be like corn fairy tour type numbers, but <laughs> like set this like 17 under. I don't think that's probably out of the question if the winds stay down. Yeah, 20 under by Hendrick Stenson in 2016 in a different course is a British Open record. Um, some some gambling podcasts apparently feel like that's that's under threat this weekend. So we'll see. Well, that that course isn't like the US like the USGA when they do it where they just bake everything. Like there's right. very little they can do. So it's uh there for the taking. No, you just if you chip and putt well, the ball's gonna roll for you when it's uh you know playing like concrete. So I say this as if I know how to chip or putt well, but I do know what it's like to play on concrete. Yeah, yeah, you, you've uh, played for, played on some concrete. Yeah, I mean, when you're as bad as I am and you play off the cart path as often as I do, or you know, just playing in the state of Nebraska where there's no <laughs> precipitation for a while, you get that. You get that. Have you played golf since we last played? No. Do you think you'll get another round in this year? Uh, probably not. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. George, it's George Costanza. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Clearly. Well, you're, you're welcome to play anytime. Any other thoughts that you would like to get off your chest here in July? No. Do you want to talk about media days having started and what a sad thing that is because it means the summer is over? Yeah. We, we got uh, <laughs> like a week of summer after all the commits in June, official visits. Um, the the subsequent July decisions that that came in, and uh, Big Ten Media Days is like less than two weeks. Yeah, we're like ten days away. Yeah. And fan, fan Day actually is uh, also the same number of days away. Did you see that the Big Twelve Commissioner wants his uh, league to cater to eighteen to twenty four year olds? Like that's where that's who they're they're trying to be hipper. Is what he said. Is that like more TikToks? What what? Uh, what uh... Well, what I was going to ask you is like, how do you make your league more hip when you're the Big Twelve? <laughs> the do, only thing I can think of is they have to release some like early '90s Sega style commercials 
with the black and the white and the guy screaming Sega in the background, like in order to attract the type of people that they want. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, how, how sexy can you make Manhattan, Kansas and still water? Lubbock, Texas and yeah. Waco and yeah. Yeah. I just feel like it's just going to be a lot of highlights of the bounce house. And basically like we have other teams too. Well, and so who are, who are they adding? They've got they're adding Cincinnati, Cincinnati okay, uh, Central Florida, Houston, and BYU. Okay, well, and they're okay. attempting to add more teams, but since everything got really hot with UCLA and USC, and then everyone was on the precipice of college football Armageddon, I feel like it's cooled off again. Yeah, it's uh, it was hot and heavy for a minute, and now it's not. Yeah, so. All right. Well, that's your homework. How do you make the Big 12 sexy? I'll have 10 ideas on your desk when I return. All right. Outstanding. Looking forward to that. Uh, Anything else? No. All right. That's it. We're done. We'll see you next week. Be sure to check out Husker 24-7 plenty of coverage. As recruits keep rolling in with commitments, uh, we have the coverage for you there. And, of course, we're rolling through our most indispensable Huskers list. I even know what number we're at right now. Brunch, do you know? Is it 12? Uh, it's 12, and spoiler alert, it's Ramir Johnson. Oh, well, what a great podcast to have yeah. this, uh, this discussion. So the most indispensable Huskers rolling along there, and of course, uh, we're going to be right in the thick of it. We're only 10 days away from media day starting, what, probably 13 days away from practice getting underway, and then, you know, I mean, once once fall camp starts, it's just a slow march to the to Ireland. You have everything ready to go? You have your your trip booked up? Trip is booked. Currently watching the minute-by-minute minute updates on the euro to dollar. Um, <laughs> it's it's basically even right now, so it's, uh, oh, wow. it's, it's good for the math. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we will, uh, we'll catch you next week with another edition of Husker 24-7 Podcast.